Do they need to do a cost-benefit analysis of the value derived in any given financial year? In public libraries, New Zealanders are allowed to conduct research that is purely driven by individual curiosity without any need to satisfy other criteria. Literature, broadly defined, is more important than anything else on offer to some public library customers. For many people, the value of using a public library is that they can read purely for fun and or fill their brains with other people's ideas as much as they want. Some readers regard the visit to the public library as an essential part of their weekly social life. To be physically surrounded by rich content, they derive a sense of belonging by sharing this valuable space with other readers in a real social network. When you add together the contribution that libraries make to New Zealand, it's obvious that collectively and diversely, we help New Zealanders to turn knowledge into value, not only economic value, but also cultural and social value. But what does the National Library do? The purpose of the National Library under its legislation is to enrich the cultural and economic life of New Zealand and its interchanges with other nations. My interpretation of this is that we turn knowledge into value for New Zealand. As a National Library, we, turn, we aim to provide leadership by collecting, protecting and promoting the documentary heritage of New Zealand. We connect New Zealanders to knowledge and ideas from around the world. And we support a network of libraries across the country to turn knowledge and ideas into value. The Alexander Turnbull Library continues to be an excellent research library, holding great documentary treasure on behalf of the nation. The team, led by Chief Librarian Chris Sike, continues to build a stronger and stronger collection of material relating to New Zealand and the Pacific to be held in perpetuity. Next year, we will complete the eagerly awaited return of refreshed and modernised Turnbull Research Services to the Molesworth Street building in Wellington. Our treasured collections will be protected in world-class storage environments better than ever before. Facilities for researchers online and in person will be better than ever before. In Dunedin last year, Chris told this conference how he has been able to strengthen the work we do to support iwi. Our move into the DIA means that iwi relationships are now coordinated formally across the whole department. We remain committed to this important work. And in the year ahead, we expect to assist with the government's full response to the Waitangi Tribunal's report on the Y262 claim, particularly in regard to our role around Mataronga Māori. Some of you know that we're working in partnership with our new departmental colleagues, Archives New Zealand, to see if we can create a persuasive business case for moving the Treaty of Waitangi to the Molesworth Street building. Sorry. Along with the Treaty of Waitangi, other hugely important documents would be moved into the revamped ground floor of the National Library building. It would also, the business case would also weigh up the arguments around a shared research service being provided from Molesworth Street, alongside the improved showcase for the nation's documentary treasures. But I believe that the real benefit of this proposal is that in the long term, the alliance between the National Library and Archives New Zealand will strengthen the perceived value of New Zealand's documentary heritage. We'll probably know next week if the plan will proceed or not. The initiative has moved very quickly as the result of the amalgamation of the National Library and Archives New Zealand into the Department of Internal Affairs. And this has encouraged us to look radically 
at ways of sharing the collective resources available to us. Whether or not the business case goes ahead, it's clear to me that we are entering into a new period of closer cooperation between Archives New Zealand and the National Library. Some of you will also be familiar with work we started last year on building a national perspective on documentary heritage. This work has not been forgotten, and I will be discussing it with Greg Goulding, Chief Archivist, in the first instance, to assist in implementing some practical measures in this area. Our work is not only about documentary heritage. Our literacy, learning, and public programs team, led by Geraldine Howell, have been fully busy in the last year. Sadly, much of that work this year has been about restoring the service to schools from the Christchurch base. This is what remains of the old National Library building in Christchurch. The service was severely disrupted by the February earthquake. And I'll take this opportunity now to thank the staff involved and applaud their efforts over a very long and difficult period in their domestic and working lives. You'll be pleased to know that the service is now up and running again from its new Christchurch base at Cavendish Business Park. Meanwhile, the government has confirmed that it plans to introduce ultra-fast broadband into primary and secondary schools throughout the country over the next five years. This initiative provides a platform for a fundamental rethink about how the National Library can best support literacy and learning in schools with shared digital content and services. You can expect to see some exciting developments in this space before next year's conference. Similarly, the government's Rural Broadband Initiative has added fresh impetus to the Aotearoa People's Network Kaharoa, with about 100 rural library locations potentially coming into scope for high-speed connectivity. A long-awaited new development in our online presence is the launch just recently of National Library Beta. This enables users to search right across our collections in one go, including books, manuscripts, photos, and over two million pages of papers past newspapers. It is a work in development, so let us know what you think. Now, we wouldn't have made the, any of this progress without the work of the previous acting national librarian, Sue Sutherland, and of course, the previous national librarian, Penny Carnaby. As ever, we owe a debt of gratitude to those who led the way before us. Let me also say that the level of progress on a number of these matters would probably not have happened without us being part of the Department of Internal Affairs. In the new setup within the DIA, the National Library is part of the Knowledge, Information, Research and Technology branch, usually abbreviated as CURT. The DIA Deputy Chief Executive to whom I report is Stephen Crombie. His responsibilities as head of CURT include the Government Technology Service, GTS. Stephen was previously the general manager of GTS and he has influence across government in those circles. As a direct result of that, he was able to position the National Library as a key player in the school and rural broadband initiatives I mentioned previously. Some of the biggest opportunities and challenges for the National Library lie in the radical shift to digital and the reshaping of knowledge and information. As part of CURT, the National Library is now at the heart of government thinking and planning to achieve a transformation in the way the public sector uses digital technologies to become much more efficient and effective in service delivery. The National Library has already played an active part with pioneering services such as the National Digital Heritage Archive, Digital New Zealand, and recently Kotui. Up until now, the National Library has led these developments from within one division known as the National Digital Library. That is changing. I have proposed a different way of operating that shifts our approach to digital to be a whole of team responsibility for the senior management of the library. 
The future of digital for us means not just sharing New Zealand content online, but also rethinking how we most effectively help to connect New Zealanders to the world's knowledge. In the age of Google, we either abandon the idea that we are in the business of connecting people to digital knowledge, or we rapidly develop our operating models to add significant value. Notwithstanding the success of NDHA, Digital New Zealand, Kotui, and so on, the National Library cannot afford to rest on its laurels. The environment around us is changing faster than ever before, and I don't expect it to slow down anytime soon. I have asked my senior staff to think about the way the landscape will look in 10 years' time. We have a fabulous new piece of hardware to help us with that. <laughs> We're going to try to see what the National Library will look like in the context of the changes taking place in our partner sectors. How will education change in New Zealand? How will publishing change globally? What will be possible with new technology? In the months ahead, our public programs team are planning new partnerships with innovative agencies in the field of science, sharing their futuristic thinking through the National Library's customer networks. Through the next year, we will facilitate conversations with colleagues across the library sector in New Zealand and with overseas colleagues. I'll be visiting the National Library of Singapore in a couple of weeks' time to sign a, five, a new five-year cooperation agreement to exchange knowledge and ideas for the future. And we're delighted to have two colleagues from Singapore enrolled for this conference. Straight after this Lianza conference, I will host a meeting of NSLA, the National and State Librarians of Australasia, in Auckland. And we will begin a refresh of the Reimagining Libraries uh, program that began in t just in 2008. We're about to start a conversation also with the Association of Public Library Managers on a refresh of the Public Library's strategic framework. And throughout this conference, you can tell me your thoughts and ideas on the future through the Twitter hashtag NLNZFuture or by email at nlnzfeedback at dia.government.nz, or by leaving notes and comments at our National Library stand, and I'll be on the stand after this speech at the tea break. Of course, nobody has a crystal ball, and countless scenarios are possible in the next decade. The point is that as leaders in the profession, it is our responsibility to describe the preferred scenario for the future of our services and persuade decision makers to pursue that future rather than wait for the future to happen to us. I believe that there's an urgency about this task. I salute the work that June Garcia and her Ineli colleagues are doing. On behalf of the National Library team, I pay tribute to the generosity and vision of Bill and Melinda Gates in supporting public libraries around the world. It's a delight for us to have such a rich international mix of young innovators and their slightly older sponsors and mentors here in New Zealand. I mentioned at the start of my talk that some of my colleagues in the DIA are skeptical about the need for librarians in the future as they look to a not so distant future when analytic tools transform the way we manage digital data. So what is our response as librarians? Do we resort to the assertion that most of our paper-based content will remain unsearchable until it's digitized, and that won't happen for many, many years? Well, how does that position us in a world where, for the new generations of users, if it can't be found on the web, it doesn't exist? And if we simply digitize all our content and give it away, then will these fabulous new analytical tools remove the need for professionals who know where to look for answers? It seems to me that a good place to start is by reaffirming the fundamental purpose of libraries and the values of librarianship. In an age when knowledge is exploding and most new knowledge is not held in physical collections, what purpose do librarians have that adds value 
to the increasingly sophisticated search and analytical data tools of Google, Microsoft, and the like. Librarians value lifelong learning, independent decision-making, and cultural development. They value equality of access to information and knowledge for all, and the removal of barriers to access where they exist. They value intellectual freedom, enabling learners to acquire the learning content and tools that allow them to fully develop their capacities. Librarians value the fundamental rights of users to access and publish information on the internet without restriction. And librarians value linguistic diversity and the expression, creation, and dissemination of cultural heritage. These are all roles of librarians that do not depend on organizing collections or handcrafting metadata. They cannot be replaced by commercial search engines and data analytics. And if they sound familiar to you, they should, as these principles are all in IFLA and UNESCO's manifestos for libraries. They remain highly relevant to us today. But we are faced with some of our biggest challenges ever. The first one is unstructured data. Where do libraries fit in extracting value from 1,800 exabytes of information? The upside is that metadata is essential and is growing at twice the rate of data creation. The downside is that most of this is being generated automatically by increasingly smart algorithms. Do we develop capability in big data analysis and retrieval, or perhaps specialize in curated information and metadata? The National Library has sponsored the visit of Karen Coyle to speak at this conference, and I encourage you to listen to her words of wisdom on this topic tomorrow. Ultra-fast broadband and smart mobile devices, combined with a vast choice of online content and e-books, will soon mean that users can be online anywhere and connected to any information they want. What does this mean for our public buildings, spaces, and collections? What is the business case for the physical presence of libraries in future? I'm delighted that some of the Inele innovators are looking at this topic in the months ahead, and I look forward to learning more from them. The third big challenge, free or at least affordable access to library services. In a world of digital publishing where authors and publishers increasingly depend on revenue through subscription models and licensing deals, how do free library services remain viable? What are the implications of libraries licensing all of their information and not owning copies of any of it? Or is there a model for libraries to continue to own digital assets? Most of all, how important is the free at the point of use principle as an underlying principle for libraries? The forthcoming review of the strategic framework for public libraries in New Zealand must address that question. And lastly, how do we collaborate nationally to improve our stakeholders' perception of value that libraries deliver? How do we maximize the benefits of being part of an international profession? Do we need to revisit the UNESCO manifesto to bring its language up to date? If not, do we run the risk of appearing increasingly irrelevant to colleagues in partner sectors who do not share our professional values. These are big challenges for all of us. Let me remind you that throughout this conference, you can tell me your thoughts and ideas on the future through Twitter or talking to us at the stand here at the conference. In the meantime, we still have essential services to maintain and develop to support libraries throughout New Zealand. We will still collect, protect, and promote the documentary heritage of New Zealand in paper and in digital modes. And we will continue to connect New Zealanders to new ideas from around the world, inspiring mashups of old and new knowledge that anyone can discover and share. It is clear, however, that many libraries in New Zealand 
will need to change. No longer can we simply morph as we move with the times. Morph is the wrong term because by definition that implies transitional change. The challenges I have mentioned will require transformational change that will affect us all in some way. I assure you that the team at the National Library is committed to navigating a course for the future. We will be looking to strengthen existing partnerships and build new ones. It doesn't make any sense for any institution to tackle these challenges alone. Whatever technology is used, and however much data and broadband change our environment, the National Library exists to support the whole library network throughout the country. Together, I am confident that we will go on enriching the cultural and economic life of New Zealand by turning knowledge into value. Norera, kanui mo tene wa, tene te mihi ki a koto, e aku nui, e aku rahi, tena koto, tena koto, tena tato katoa. Tato tato e tu tira mai ngai we tato tato e faya te mara matanga me te aroha e ngai we kia ta patahi kia koha rira tato tato e tato Thank you, Bill. Um, I did say that any any Pākehā who tries their Māori out on me gets a hug, and uh, one one brave Pākehā woman did try some out yesterday afternoon, so she got a hug. And I came in here, and the uh, the mayor launches into Māori and took off before I get hold of her. <laughs> Jane's over there, you get a hug later. And uh, Bill, I'll just uh, <laughs> fix you up there, and it's uh, my uh, pleasure to give the floor back to to Jane to. Um, to introduce the, uh, bring on the Alianza Fellowship Awards. Thank you. Welcome to this very special part of the conference where we recognise and celebrate our colleagues who've been awarded fellowships this year. A fellow of Alianza is a personal member of the association who's made a significant contribution to the advancement of librarianship and or information management through a sustained record of achievements or who has demonstrated outstanding qualities of leadership, teaching or research. Beryl, I'd like to invite you to join me on the stage. You're welcome to take a seat. <laughs> Beryl Anderson. Beryl has been a member of Lianza for 40 years, filling roles in library and information management as a library professional. Beryl was a manager of the National Forestry Library of New Zealand at New Zealand Forest Research Institute for 20 years. 
This library played an important role in the development of library and information services to businesses, research institutions, universities and government bodies in forestry. Beryl was at the forefront of the uptake of new technology for online reference, database development, and in the 1990s, Sydney, Science Information Database, now electronically yours, which captured and delivered the science outputs of the Institute. Beryl became the Library Services Manager for Statistics New Zealand in 2000, which included records management. She oversaw the publishing of statistical publications 1840 to 2000 and participated in e-government projects in relation to metadata and thesauri, SONZ and FONZ. In 2003, Beryl joined ESR, the Institute of Environmental Science and Research. She has developed policies for knowledge management and document management systems, including the intranet. Since 2010, Beryl has also been responsible for information security with responsibility for information governments and regulatory compliance. Beryl is current chair of the Lianza Professional Registration Board and was actively involved in developing the body of knowledge 1 to 10. She has served twice as a national councillor, convened a Lianza conference, chaired the subcommittee for standards for special libraries, and is an active member of the Records Management Association of Australasia. She's been chair of the Lianza Gender Equity Task Force from 2007 to 2008. And she's the current Lianza appointee on the Open Polytechnic Information and Library Studies Advisory Committee. She has been active in community service as a volunteer librarian in Fiji for two years and in the National Council for Women in New Zealand, including serving as National Secretary and President. She's been a ministerial appointee and a delegate to a number of national and international quasi-governmental meetings. Beryl Anderson's influence in the library and information sector at the personal, regional and national level makes her a worthy recipient of the Lianza Fellowship Award. Thank you very much, Jane. I arrived home rather late one night and cleared the mailbox and thought, Lienza, Bill, put it aside. And I was reading another piece of mail and I thought, that's funny, I've paid my membership, renewed my registration fees, what do they want? So I opened the letter, and at the, t at the time, you might, I don't know if you recall, but chronic and other legal highs were predominant in the news media. Well, opening and reading that letter was very definitely a legal high, and my feet didn't touch the ground for about 48 hours. So I'd like to thank whomever nominated me, the Credentials Committee for endorsing the nomination, and the Lianza Council for accepting and recommending that I...